Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you here. And uh, we are in different locations, as is typical these days. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. My name is uh, C.R. Wiley. My friends call me Chris. Everyone calls me Chris. The only people who call me C.R. Wiley are people who just know me through my books. Speaking of my books, I've got a book out on Tom Bombadil that's doing pretty well and uh, kind of making the rounds in the Tolkien world. And uh, I'm pleased about that. Anyway, that's enough about me. How about you guys? How about you, Tom? Tell us about yourself. Tom Price. I'm a teacher uh, above all. I teach at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and University of St. Joseph and other places. Teach systematic theology, philosophy, ethics, and uh, usually whatever else comes down the pike <laughs> to be taught. <laughs> I'm teaching religion uh, in America, yeah. that's, which is a new course for me. So. <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of know. I kind of know that feeling. I was when I was teaching and when I was t- teaching college uh, courses. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of different stuff they threw at me to do. So yeah, anyway. yeah so yeah, I, I right, come, you're, up, you're, come up with things every day. So and I'm, I'm writing some stuff <laughs> that's that's on, on its verge. It, it is coming to uh, to finality. So um, hang in there. All right, all right. Hang in there, people. All right, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. How about you, Glenn? <clears throat> I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired history professor, currently a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries and a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Uh, I have a number of books out, one of them that is going to be on the way with Canon Press, uh, though I haven't gotten a release date yet. Okay. Well, good stuff. Speaking uh about books and writing books, I'm in the kind of the early phases of writing one myself. And uh, kind of the working title is, uh, or the working title uh, is the, the Boniface option. I'm not sure I'm going to stick with that. These options, they've been exercised. I mean, I mean everybody's got an option. So I'm not <laughs> sure I'm going to stick with that. Maybe I will. But um, as part of the sort of, so, I, you know, I've written uh, three books uh, on households, kind of the household trilogy. And now I want to move on to some other things kind of cultural apologetics, but also kind of ecclesiology. And uh, one, of the, one of the authorities that I'm, I'm spending some time with is um, Philip Reef. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Philip Reef today. But before I do, I want to I show something to you guys. I promised a young man in my church that I would, I would do this. Uh, I have here a drawing of a pug. Uh-uh. Here we go. There's a pug. Uh-huh. This is a connect the dots, and this is by uh, Weston Spiller, and it's dedicated to the theology podcast. So if you are watching there in you know on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, you can see the marvelous job that uh, <laughs> Weston did. He ha- he handed this to me on church on Sunday after church on Sunday. So I, like, nice. oh, yeah, I got to show that to people. So if you have some art that you have created that features us. <laughs> the show or a pug, send them to us, and we will share the T-shirt or a, or, or a glass or maybe a wine, even a yeah. wine glass. You know, we may may have yeah, to have yeah. our own got... wine at one day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ho- hopefully, it won't feature a three-headed pug with our mugs. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Those will another be worth money one day. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do have one that I did about. Uh, uh, a pug that was like a studio wrestler, Pugnacious the Punisher. I don't know if you guys remember that one. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'll share that one with some folks someday. But yeah. but back to the theme of the show. So uh, Philip Reef. So Philip Speaking Reef of death is, works. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. We'll, we'll get to death works in a moment. <laughs> Philip Reef. Uh, for the folks who who read uh, Carl Truman's latest book, that name may ring a bell. Uh, Carl Truman was uh, challenged by uh, Rod Dreher to write a book on Philip Reef, and I think so it was that this led book to, here, right? Right, Triumph of the Therapy. Uh, not that, not Triumph of the Therapy. But, but what, what's the title of that one again? Uh, uh, the Rise and Triumph of Modern Self. Yeah, it's in, it got Triumph. Triumph yeah, the rise is and in triumph. the title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Triumph of the Modern Self, and uh, that book uh, is a book that features Reef's uh, sort of critique of the, you know, sort of modernity and the situation that we face today uh, very prominently. So I've been aware of, of Reef for some time, but I never got into, you know, his uh, seminal works, uh, tr- you know, for example, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, the book that really made, gave, made his name was on Freud, 
And uh, I think it was Sigmund Freud, uh, Mind of the Moralist or something like that. And, uh, and consequently, I always associated him because, you know, you've got therapeutic and Freud. I always thought that he was a, a psychologist, mm-hmm. but he's really not. He's, he's really a, just a, a, a person who is uh, uh, looking at uh, larger trends in terms, you know, in terms of uh, how th- things have unfolded in the West in the last few hundred years and, and uh, kind of the, the cultural situation on the ground that we, we live in. Uh, so he's really more kind of, uh, you know, in the spirit of, say, a Remy Bragg or a Charles Taylor. And as I've thought about uh, him, as I've been reading The Triumph of the Therapeutic, I, I, you know, I had actually confused him with Paul Vitz. You remember Paul Vitz? Yeah. Uh, the guy who was, uh, he's a good thinker too. I don't think he's on the same level as Reef. I mean, Reef has really impressed me as I've, I've said. Yeah, doc, he writes on a, di- a different level. I mean, and he, he he actually engages, I think, a different set of traditions. Um, Paul Vitz um, definitely deals with that kind of, um, I mean, like like currents in in kind of modern notions of the self. And I, I think he's, he's done yeah. decent work, Paul Vitz. I mean, he even wrote yeah. one recently on the father, I think, uh, he's, uh, re- relating atheism yep. to fatherlessness. Yeah, yeah. And he has one on the yeah, self the faith- which I have around here somewhere I haven't read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, The Faith of the Fatherless was yeah. uh, Vitz, Vitz's book on uh, atheism. And it, he drew a connection between sort of the alienation from actual literal fathers and atheists who have uh, been pretty significant in the last couple of hundred years in, in terms of yeah. their writings. But I guess uh, what it gets coming back to, to Reef, I, I actually think that uh, as I'm reflecting on Reef, that uh, he's superior to, Ch- to Taylor. I you know there are a lot of things in Taylor that are worthwhile, uh, particularly certain concepts like the imag- you know, the social imaginary or the buffered self and so forth. But uh, when I read Taylor, I, I just read analysis. I don't read any prescriptive, you know, anything that's helpful in a, in a prescriptive way, uh, you know, in terms of how do you, how do you uh, push back against some of these developments? You, you don't have that in Taylor as far as I can see. Mo- most, like when I, when I read Taylor, I come away depressed, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, because all, all he does is like say, well, we tried that, we tried that, we tried that, and they all failed. <laughs> yeah, well, well Taylor ch- kind of, he, he, I think t- Taylor's way of doing it is kind of what a lot of old philosophers thought to do. And, and I even think Bart got caught into this in theology, is that in order to move through something, you almost had to work through something. Um, but there is the, the, the position of having to reject something. And I think Taylor doesn't do that. T- Taylor's like, how do, how do we find this? Oh, all right, we're in the imminent frame. How do we work through it from the imminent frame? Where, whereas, you know, I think myself would say, wait a minute, the imminent frame is just simply wrong. <laughs> it's just simply wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think right, Taylor yeah, doesn't yeah, go there. He wants to subvert from within. I think we can actually engage it from, from just a, a different set of analysis. Yeah, and, and I think that, when it comes to that, reef is helpful, and maybe, and I, maybe I mentioned it in the you know the, the pre-show discussion. But if I'm repeating myself, please forgive me. But what's fascinating about reef is he's a secular Jew. Uh, yeah. He's not he's not re- writing as a uh, you know a uh, practicing Jew or a pra- you know a, a believing Christian. He's writing just simply uh, uh, as a as a as a you know person who's appalled at certain developments in the history of the West. And uh, his analysis uh, is really helpful in a number of respects, not least being, you know, some of the marvelous uh, rhetoric that, uh, that uh, you can develop as you draw on his work. Because in, in terms of his analysis, he doesn't shy away from value judgments at all. Um, yeah. he, you know, when you, when you use a term like death works, <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to use, it's hard to say that in a clinical <laughs> tone. <laughs> it's just that, that is condemnation, baby. Yeah. And, uh, so when it comes to, to, you know, what he's done, I think it's helpful. So I want to, I want to spend a little time kind of reflecting upon the framework within which, uh, at least to this point I've been introduced to in, uh, his work. Uh, read a few quotes, and then discuss a little bit what I'm I'm doing with it in my own writing. But any other thoughts you guys have on him before we kind of jump into some of that? 
Yeah, I think generally his idea of death works and especially the anti-culture, they sort of go hand in hand. I think that, I imagine we're going to get into both of those, but I think those are really critical for understanding the world today. Um, yeah. they're, they're brilliant insights, especially, you know, in light of what's been going on over the last few years. Yeah, yeah, we're sort of... Uh, you know, in the world that he saw coming uh, a long way back. And a lot of people saw it coming. I mean, this is the only people who were surprised about the situation on the ground today are people who just, you know, haven't read a whole lot uh, you know, in terms of just the general sweep of Western culture and its trajectory. Uh, or maybe they, they just thought that the, the things that people like us warned them about were just the, the raving lunacies of, 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 uh, you know, ivory tower academic types. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in the nineties telling people, this is what's going to happen here, here, and here. And they'd all just would write me off and say, ah, you know, yeah, that, that stuff will never happen. Well, you know, the difference between uh, conspiracy theory and reality these days is about three weeks. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Things are kind of picking up in, in the pace. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, I feel, I feel vindicated in, in many respects, but also sad. You know, yeah. I was part of a denomination. I had a, a friend just con contacted me uh, uh, a while back, uh, not too long ago, maybe a, a week or two back, who's pretty well connected in that world, is a theologian. And, and uh, I got his text at like six in the morning, and he said, friend, you were right. Everything you said is happening. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, well, I'm, uh, I'm kind of sad that I was right. I, it's not that I want anything bad to happen to that denomination or those people. I, a lot of them are folks that I, I remember very fondly and, and still have friendships with. But, uh, but when I, when I would talk to folks, even people who were, you know, in, you know, studying theology or teaching philosophy, uh, even those folks thought maybe I was being a little alarmist, but it's all come to pass. Yeah, anyway. that's one of that's one of the I, I think that's one of the hard parts of I mean when you, you study I mean uh, you know studying theology and 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 the the large scale realm of ideas and the impact of them to to be able to to almost forecast certain things is I don't like sitting back and saying I was right <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But but it, it, it becomes it's it's not so difficult after you get a grip of you know certain ideas and their and their trends their, these certain patterns that go on, and and it is I think like uh, I think Glenn has said before and, and you've said similarly the hardest part is when you're in the middle of it having to try to convince people you know that that you know what you think of as reality is actually been been handed to you by a whole history of ideas and formation that that aren't self-evident or self-grounding um and that that they are disturbingly harmful to you that that's a that's a tough place to be in but i think we begin to see um how serious these things can be when when uh when they're unhinged from from a, a deeper resource of reality. Anyway, I mean that that was just kind of to follow yeah, your point. Yeah. I'll let you run yeah. with your topic now. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll interrupt him one more time. Then I'll let him <laughs> run. Um, one one of the things that I've argued in in um, one of my books was that any worldview that becomes dominant in a culture, if it lasts long enough, will lead inevitably to its logical consequences, or more likely its illogical consequences. In other words, worldviews have an internal logic that drive them forward. And when it's adopted, most of the people who adopt the worldview don't actually understand where it's going to lead. Right. If you are someone like C.S. Lewis, if you're a Francis Schaeffer, if you're a Philip Reith, what they did that makes them look so prophetic is they looked at the logic of the culture and said, where does this end? Right. And if you think that through, you know, people will say, yeah, that's a slippery slope. It's alarmist. It's this, it's that, or the other thing. The logic is inexorable. It will carry itself through. And that's why these guys, are, we look at them and we're just sort of astonished at how prescient they were. Well, all they were doing is looking at the worldview and saying, yeah, you know what? This is where this leads. Right, right. Well, let's go to Philip Reef here. Uh, I think the place to begin 
when I, when I'm thinking about you know sort of his his uh, outlook is uh, this this book uh, that is entitled My Life Among the Death Works. It's probably the most strident of the books he wrote. Now I, I've not. Uh, been a, you know, had any introduction to the book that you were telling us about a few minutes ago, Tom, I think before the show got started on Grace, which was uh, published in 2008. What was the title of that one again? It's called Charisma, the Gift of Grace and How It Has Been Taken Away from Us. And I, and I think this is, like you said a little a little while ago, it's, it's a retrieval work. You know, it, it's retrieving right. riches of something prior to something else that really limits these yeah. riches. Yeah. So what, what my life among the death works is addressing is, uh, stuff we were just talking about with, uh, you know, our, our friend, Arthur Kwan Lee, um, you know, when he was talking about sort of the, the environment in which he's worked as a fine artist, uh, you know, in which somebody can take a banana and put it, you know, tape it to a wall of duct tape and call it art and sell it for hundreds of thousands <laughs> of dollars that's a death work, you know? And so what, what, what is, what is a death work? Well, you have to sort of understand sort of the larger framework that, um, you know, what you see uh, with Reef and how he establishes it. And it's, it's not brand new stuff. The framework is is not brand new stuff. Uh, It's stuff that we see in, in, in people like Taylor or maybe even people like Owen Barfield. Um, What you have is he says, there are three worlds. So he talks about first world, second world and third world. First world uh, is antiquity, uh, kind of pre-Christian uh, pagan uh, outlooks. Uh, what you have is, you know, sort of this mythological, sort of animistic uh, way of thinking, polytheistic way of thinking, in which everything is meaningful and you are, you are uh, sort of embedded in this uh, world that is suffused with meaning and, uh, you know, Taylor talks about, you know, sort of the permeable self, this idea that there are these realities that exist outside of oneself, but can permeate or sort of, sort of, uh, impinge upon the self and even possess you, uh, that are spiritual and, and, and nature. And, uh, these are real, uh, things, uh, that exist outside of the self and are resonant in the world around us. So um, it's a fully enchanted, haunted, scary, beautiful world that we we dwell in. Then uh, second world is uh, the outworking of the of the uh, mono, great monotheisms: uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, in which there is a transcendent God who has brought the world into to being, uh, who has a purpose for it, and uh, who is uh, overseeing it providentially and judging it and bringing it to some future uh, resolution or uh, parousia down the line. And uh, consequently, the world is still full of meaning, but not full of presences so much as it is, uh, you know, uh, sort of ordered by laws that are given by the lawgiver. And these laws, uh, uh, you know, are the very basis for human culture. And that's one of the things that I think um, is important with Reef. Reef believed that uh, the what he refers to as the interdicts, uh, the, these laws, are the very sort of uh, genesis of culture, what we call culture. Um, you can't have culture without them. Um, yeah. Now, he's picking up a bit on Freud there. He is a, Freud, yeah. a scholar of Freud. Uh, Freud believed that uh, cultures were defined by their taboos. Right, right. You know, so this is, this is a less crass version of that idea. Yeah. Well, taboos would be like first world. Laws would be second world. And then uh, you've got third world. But before I, but before I get to that, there's also um, with, within the second world, you've got the interdicts, but you also have the remissive and the transgressive. The transgressive is obviously the defiance of the law or the breaking of the law. The remissive is the sort of the, the, the things that have, that go on in the culture that help to address the, 
the, uh, the challenges of living under the law. You know, there are, there are times of the year where, you know, you can kind of loosen up a little bit. Uh, there are provisions for your... Well, that's why you have fe- you know, festival, your, right? Fest- festival. I mean, I was yeah. Taylor's point, this, this place at which all this energy yeah. is allowed to unleash, you know, this pressure right. allowed to kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's where, you know, Reef and Taylor are on the same page. But yeah. also you've got, you know, the sacrificial system. You've got sacrifices that can be made and you can be, you can find yourself out of accord with the sacred order. And this is another way he puts it. He says, you know, the social order is in, in some sense always a reflection of or an extension of or an embodiment of the sacred order. So there's a sacred order. And according to Reef, there is no culture without sacred order. Now, this is an interesting point at which Reef and the theonomists, people like Rush Duny, would be in a com- complete agreement. Yeah. Um, you know, so here's a secular Jew and, you know, a, a very uh, strong uh, reformed uh, theologian in total agreement that at the heart of any culture is the religion, Yeah. is the sacred order. And, 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 and yeah. uh, you, you and I, I don't think that is I, I don't think that was missing in any ancient philosophy. I don't think it was missing in any ancient Christianity. I mean, I, I really think this yeah. was this was always understood is, is, is the, the, the debates tended to be around what was that sacral order, you know, what characterized right. Right. it best. Right. Um, and I think modernity was such that it came in and acted like that was something that was something we could do away from, do away with. And so because right. of that, it tries to look for, for an alternative substitute, which I think was part of its un, you know, undermining fundamentally, and which gives us post-modernity, which is nothing other than looking for a new sacral order, um, in my view. I mean, and we, we, we start to see it now with the different isms that ha- have replaced it. But, but I, think, I think that antenna is right. You, I mean, this is what um, was it, Eliot's um, Mercy Eliad. Yeah, I mean, very, very. I think this is all on that chain. I think um, you know, I, I think that they're all, they all, they all have their antenna on the the fact that that how how you understand the fundamental order of things is kind of um, inseparable from some kind of sacred order. There's there's no way to tell that yeah. story naturalistically. Yeah, even the etymologies of the words uh, culture, cultivate, and cult, or cultus, uh, are, all, they all come from the same root. Right. You know, so, so the cult, the body of religious practices that order a religion um, or an adherent of a religion, um, those are related to culture. I mean, culture is connected, is tied, it grows out of the cult as well as out of cultivation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and, the, and, and that's really kind of the, at the heart of my second book uh, on the household, uh, Household of War for the Cosmos, because that's what I'm getting into with the discussion of the cosmos. But anyway, kind of getting back to Reef. Uh, so you've got, you've got these, uh, these, these first two worlds. What is the third world? Well, we've already touched on it a little bit. Um, the third world is a world uh, in which uh, the kind of the project is the destruction of the sacred order, uh, the overturning of the sacred order. Um, and how does this occur? Well, uh, it occurs uh, in a subtle way through analysis, but in a more uh, kind of uh, proactive, if I can use that word, and aggressive uh, a way through what he refers to as death works. And death works are bananas, you know, taped to walls. The whole, the whole purpose of a death work is simply to undermine, to subvert the sacred order. And that is the outlook that, that now commands the heights, uh, entirely in Western culture. Um, so the elites of the second world, which we would be members of have been, uh, more or less, uh, you know, scuttled, uh, pushed aside. Um, and, uh, one of the quickest ways to get yourself disinvited to things is to, to demonstrate that you're actually, uh, an advocate for a second 
the second world, the sacred order. Um, that's what happened to, to Arthur. Arthur's uh, work as an artist is very self-consciously second world. Yeah. Uh, he rejected, he saw a uh, third world, you know, death works. Uh, he, he had been subject to, you know, an art school that trained him in basically blasphemy. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he didn't want to do that anymore. He didn't want to be a part of that. And the moment that he, de- he declared his, his allegiance uh, to the sacred order was the day that he was disinvited. Arthur, uh, you know, he was celebrated and uh, won awards because people didn't really understand what he was up to. <laughs> but when, when he just got tired of going along with stuff anymore and said, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to go along with you, that was the day that he was canceled. But anyway, well, well um, there, 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 I mean, there is this long, there's this long, you know, I mean, you know, uh, different theologians have talked over different periods of time to the way of the undoing of the created moral order. Um, and, and kind of this this harnessing of some kind of the, the, the um, unformed and void, if you will, that they think if you can get to, to that state, you're, you're harnessing this kind of energy um, uh, that that is more consistent with um, what it means to be participating in the root of reality rather than, you know, the 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 order of things. Um, so the the formless and void is what is attractive rather than the ordering of the six days, if you will, and the se- seventh day. I mean, if you're using the creation account. And and uh, Henri Blocher, you know, wrote in his commentary in Genesis, sort of a excellent kind of summary that there is this attempt to bring things back to the orgy, the undefined, the the kind of primal, bestial unformed, you know, the formless and void, if you will, um, that they think is going to excite this spiritual energy that is going to generate culture and life and everything else. And, and I think this is always the, the temptation of the fallen, right? That the, the garden you've been given isn't enough. Um, so you need something else. You need to take a bite of some kind of, some kind of spiritual fruit that is going to undo that and transcend it. Um, but all the while, it has no continuity with it. And this is where your Gnosticisms come in. This is where, you know, all the whole history of eliminating the good gift of form, shape, ends, kinds, flourishing that, that you know, that the creation right. account gives, for example, or, or it's, it's redemption. And I think this is what he has his antenna on, is that the, you know, that there is this sense in which one thinks one liberates oneself spiritually by ridding oneself of of the good gifts as a christian of of form order and fulfillment and i, I think that's really what, yeah. what the big difference is yeah i think one of the challenges that we face is because so much of sort of the uh, I guess uh, the rhetoric and the apologetic of the early church was directed against the first world. Yeah. That we are kind of blind to what we're facing with the third world. So like the neo-pagan is not just simply the pagan uh, recovered. You know, C.S. Lewis said, "If we if we had that, we you know we'd have it made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we we know how to beat that. The, yeah. the trouble is, is this new paganism is yeah. far more uh, dangerous uh, than that. And because it, it's, I, I think it's because this is. So let me throw you, let me throw out a few uh, terms that I'm I'm working with, trying to develop my own approach to this. So." Uh, the idolatry of zero. So the problem that we face when we talk about idolatry is we're fixated on nouns, you know, uh, you know, whether we're talking about money or we're talking about, you know, uh, some kind of physical thing that we think provides us access to some spiritual reality or power uh, that we can master through our idolatry. Um, whereas with the idolatry of zero, what we're, what we're actually envisioning is kind of returning to the spirit hovering over the waters or brooding over the waters and who the spirit is in our minds is us individually. 
Yeah. Now, th this connects in, I think, with something I've I've uh, thought about for a while. Um, you know, in in the Middle Ages and the ancient world, metaphysics was the starting point of philosophy. Today, epistemology is the starting point for philosophy. Right. And the dominant epistemology is one that fundamentally denies the possibility of objective knowledge. Right. You know, I've, I remember it, it being really struck in classes before where I was teaching what Christians believed. And, uh, you know, in a history class, just historically, this is what they believed. And the students looked at me really troubled and said, how did they know that? Right, right. You know, the idea being, well, they've got this opinion. Other people have that opinion. They're all equally valid because right. we're in, moving into a world of standpoint epistemology, which says that what you think is determined entirely by factors that are extrinsic to you. It's your... It's your race, it's your gender, it's your sexual orientation, it's your gender identity, it's your culture, it's your socioeconomic class, all of these kinds of things. And that gives you a perspective that tells you what you think of as truth, because there is no ob objectivity in the world. It's impossible. So there is no metaphysics. Yeah. All that's left is opinion. Yeah. Well, this is the, you know, as we've talked many shows, I mean, this is the abandonment of, of a kind of proper platonism if you will that that is mm -hmm. is realist um and again i mean i mean platonism broadly christian platonism very broadly i mean there are idealist types of platonism there is the aristotelian i don't sure. want to get into that but my, the whole point is ontologically epistemologic in terms of being and knowing um we're talking about a realism that is abandoned by just about, I mean, the, I mean, the whole move to epistemology is driven by a move to a certain kind of idealism. I don't want to get into that right now, but I mean, that, yeah. that, that that's a move away from reality, if you will. Um, and when you move away from reality, then, then the rest of the things begin to happen. Um, they, you, you become, you, you're dealing with the imposition of ideas and interpretations of ideas onto the, the way reality is. I mean, I mean, we see this all, all, all the time. Um, and th th this, I think, it, it has been part of the, I mean, this is a problem I think Reef's dealing with is, you know, his, his attempt to retrieve certain issues of, of grace and, and other issues um, are tied to the, this question of, of reality. Um, you know, the, the way in which we have to actually deal with the world into which we're embodied and engage and am not rather than impos imposing conceptions onto that reality prior to having to actually engage with that reality. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that's what a lot of this stuff is all about. Well, uh, what I'd like to do to your time is, I, is I, I'd like to read a few things uh, from My Life Among the Death Works. And, th and, this will, and these quotes will give us plenty to yeah. uh, reflect, about, reflect on. So what, what I'll do is just, uh, I'll, read a, I'll read something and then let you guys kind of go with it. And then I'll read something else and let you guys go with it. And <laughs> let's, let's see how it goes. So, th yeah. so this is uh, early on in um, the My Life Among the Death Works. In fact, this is, this, you know, I'm not going to get very far at all. Uh, this is a chapter entitled The Present World Fight. <laughs> the Present World Fight. I believe that our thirds, meaning third worlds, should be called anti-cultures. <laughs> Anti-cultures translate no sacred order into social. Recycling fantasy firsts, in other words, drawing on the first world, third worlds exist only as negations of sacred orders in seconds, meaning second worlds. So the third world draws on the first world to attack the second world without returning to the first world. Hmm. So uh, third world anti-cultures consume their negational truths as swiftly as they produce them. This gets us to this uh, situation where nothing can ever get settled or nothing can actually develop because as soon as something is proposed as a kind of new approach, as a kind of sacral order or based on some kind of new sacred, it's undermined yet again. So it's just this constant stirring up 
of, uh, you know, things and, uh, nothing but negation is, uh, able to sort of find the light of day. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I rather like the, the way he's analyzing the recycling of the first world to undermine the second, but without embracing the first world. Um, there, there's a rather well-known organization out there called the Society for Creative Anachronisms, whose goal <laughs> is to bring back the Middle Ages as it should have been, not as it was. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, what we're seeing, even in neo-pagan movements, which I've spent a fair amount of time studying, what we're seeing with them is trying to bring back paganism the way it should have been, not the way it was. Right. right. <laughs> the way it should have been, as dictated by our current sensibilities. Right, right. So it doesn't matter that they used to sacrifice animals, or for that matter, people, <laughs> right. because we're not going to do that. We're, we're above that. We know better now. But we're still going to worship the ancient gods. We're just not going to do it quite the way they did. And why do we know better? Well, because of the second world. But right. we don't want to admit that. <laughs> but we don't want to admit it. Well, well yeah, I right. mean, that, that, that's fascinating in itself. I mean, the, the way in which, I mean, you know, I remember Dave Bentley Hart's article, Christ and Nihilism. Um, you know, Christ, you know, it was that very point that when Christ comes along, he basically defangs the gods. I mean, all across the board, everywhere. Yep. Yep. Um, and so really nihilism becomes really the only, the you know, like uh, uh, Dostoevsky, the, the kind of really only alternative to Christ. And you can actually write Christ and or nihilism Um because the, the the nihilism end up morphing into a kind of uh, libertarianism in which the self is the kind of defining center. I think this is where even Reef goes, and this is where um, yep. modernity goes, where the self becomes the defining um, center of of all meaning, purpose, value, and determination of one's being. I mean, in a sense, the self begins to mimic a classical conception of some kind of God in which it is the, the generator of its own being in nature and the definer of all that's good and right and everything else. It, it is, I mean, as Bonhoeffer said, the very fruit of, you know, the eating the fruit of the Garden of Eden, right, where you will become the measure of all things, if you will. You will become the knower of right and wrong. You'll become the ground of that. You'll become like God. Um, and, and I think this is what you have going on here. Um, that, that modernity takes the riches of Christianity and completely re you know, reinterprets them from the center of this kind of self, human self, um, that, that is this exact thing, moving from the first to the third worlds, um, in a sense, um, taking the riches of, the, of, of, of Christianity, but actually undermining them in the process. Yeah, let me let me read a, a, a three more uh, quotes here um, that are, I think, really rich. One of the things he wants to sort of convey is the kind of the unconscious uh, way in which the death works are created, performed, what have you, and that's kind of part of the power or sort of to them. In other words, it's it's when it, it's when they're done unconsciously that they have power. It's it, when when people know what's going on, they lose their power. I think that this is what this implies. He says, the unconscious art of everyday death works depends entirely upon the blindness of both the death worker and those upon whom the work works. So the, again, there's a sense of, uh, you know, it, 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 all the, the, you know, the death worker begs the question all the time. And that's what we've been getting at, this sort of self-contradictory character that we if we if we look at it and analyze the situation, we can we can see pretty clearly, but no one wants to go there. Here's another one. Modern culture is far more dangerous than archaic nature or pagan mythologizing or polytheisms ever were. Mm -hmm. And that we've already said that in our own words a little earlier. Here's another one. A higher, more humane life can be lived only in obedience to the commandments of sacred order as it is addressed in culture and through its faithful creations. Now, mm -hmm. that's where Taylor never goes. Yeah. Taylor, you know, it analyzes things, I think, pretty incisively, but he never gets to prescription. 
ever. Yeah, that's a frustrating mm-hmm. thing about reading Taylor. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just sort of like say, you throw up your hands and say, well, what now? Yeah. But, yeah. but, but Reef says uh, what no one wants anyone to say. <laughs> and, yeah. and this is a guy who was an Ivy League professor. I think he was at University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, no one challenges his intelligence or his, uh, his vision or insight. Uh, and, and, in, and in this book, he is preaching the whole way yeah. through. He's attacking the death yeah. works. But anyway, any thoughts on that stuff? Well, I mean, I think you see, you know, the significance of his Judaism and <laughs> whatever his relationship yeah, yeah, to it yeah. um, come, come to the, the interpretive. I mean, you see this in Martin Buber and other figures. I mean, this is, this is something kind of inescapable at some point. Um, but, but I, I do think that the profundity of, of the way in which he recognizes this moral creative order and the way in which it isn't something that's a social construct, it's something binding, and the way in which you can't simply get around it just because you kind of want to, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's the, that's the thrust of it. You're not, you're not going to be able to kind of write yourself out of it. <laughs> um, and that, that's the way reality yeah. is. And this is what I think we, we confront today. Go ahead. Yeah. Let, let me, let me read another thing here. And this is a very, uh, it, it's, it's only six words, but I think that uh, we could we could spend the rest of our time talking about this, but I don't want to because I want to talk <laughs> about some other things too. But but this is but this is his definition of the new idolatry. Identity changes constitute the new idolatry. Now let's stop. It's not identity. It's identity changes that constitute mm-hmm. the new idolatry. Yeah. It's the will to power that he's getting at here. It's the spirit brooding over the waters, bringing in things into being. But then it's it's the guy with the television remote control who can't decide what to watch because he doesn't want to commit to anything because the f- power to choose is the only good. Well, that that's Commitment the point. Of, is the that, evil. Yeah, That's the point of the uh, First Things article by Bentley Hart when he was writing Good Stuff. That was that is the exact. That's the point of the article, Christ and nihilism. Um, uh, Christ, it, it basically, it's this notion of the uh, unpremised self, as if it doesn't have a determination, both as creature um, dependent on God for its being, but also as creature depending on God for its form and the kind it is and the unfolding that it is. So when you rid yourself of the ontological and the teleological, which, um, to use big words, basically what you are created to be and what you are created to become. <laughs> when you try to escape from that, you actually are entering the death works. When you actually truthfully enact that, you are flourishing within what you're created to be, and therefore you're going to find your eudemonism, your happiness, your fullness, and your perfection um, as the end result. So I think this is what Reef has an antenna on, um, if, uh, right. if I'm hearing him the right way. Well, I well, think you I are. Think, I think there's another dimension to it, though, too, and that's that it suggests that there is no stability. The only reality is change. The right. only reality is a constantly evolving set of norms and priorities and ideas which when you take a look at our culture, you can readily trace. Um, Things that five years ago were ridiculed as being impossible, slippery slope, uh, paranoia, conspiracy theory, are now being rigidly enforced by our uh, technocratic elites. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I think that's right, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, And And five years from now, things that we think are unthinkable now are going to be normed. Yeah, I don't don't think I want to even know what that is. Yeah. But that's but that, but that's the thing that I think that people don't want to accept. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, this reminds me of Heraclitus. You know, in this idea that change is the only reality, or being is becoming, as you've talked about plenty of times, Tom. This mm-hmm. idea that you know uh, it's sort of the dynamism. It's almost like life can only be known through the change. That there is no like stability is almost death in the minds of these people. Now, uh, permanent things, you know, that that term permanent things 
historically has been a as a has been a promise. It has been a, a you know a sort of something that people have longed for. They've wanted something stable that that could provide them with some basis for living in a world that was perceived as being you know uh, you know given over to death, and so consequently change was 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 a kind of thing to be afraid of. Yeah. Um, as opposed to something to embrace, but uh, anyway, so let me let me let me do a, let me read a couple more things. Oh, you want to say something, Glenn? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I, I forgot who it was. It might have been Lewis, uh, but someone commented that in the past the goal was to conform our souls to reality. Now it is to conform reality to our desires. Right. I think that's exactly the heart of it. Yeah. yeah. Now. I want to I want to read this quote because this will give us a lot to to think about and talk about uh, because it really strikes at the very heart of uh, you know sort of the popular way of thinking about you know the good today and he says this a multiculture is an anticulture mm-hmm. such a multiculture no longer mediates between sacred order and social orders. So in other words, multiculture or multiculturalism is a death work. Let's reflect upon that a little bit. Now, he's not saying that uh, cultures outside the West are bad. Yeah, that's right. He's not saying that. Uh, He's saying that essentially in order to even conceive of something we could call multiculturalism, we have to put to death the longing to, uh, in some way, embody the sacred order in our culture. Yeah, and in practical terms, I would just point out that unless you have a common core that people accept um, as uh, norms or standards within society, the society self-destructs. It's as simple as that. I mean, you, you, you can tolerate a degree of multicultural expression within a society as long as there is a core that everybody agrees on. Without that core, in practical terms, the society fragments and self-destructs. That is simply common sense, which is remarkably uncommon these days. Well, let, let me give you a little Especially story. academics. Well, let me give you a little story about how this actually works out in sort of practical everyday ways. So when I lived in Cambridge years ago, I lived in an apartment building uh, alongside people from all over the world. Um, I was in, within this particular apartment building. There were 10 apartments. And uh, I think uh, I was, uh, you know, my wife and I were the only, apart from the people right across the hall from us who were African-Americans, Blacks, were the only people who had been born in the United States. So the people who lived across the hall from us, they were our good friends. We knew them for a long time. And us. But everybody else in the building was basically from Southeast Asia. So one night, um, about three in the morning, my uh, kitchen ceiling collapsed. (laughs) Just crashed down. Now, what had happened was, is that the people above us from Cambodia, uh, somebody in that uh, apartment had left the water running in the kitchen sink. Now, uh, these are people who didn't come from um, a, uh, a world where there was running water or indoor plumbing. Uh, it just never occurred to them that perhaps this could be a problem. Well, it was a problem because the, there was apparently some, some clogging in the, in the P-trap in the sink. The, 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 the sink filled up, overflowed, flooded the entire kitchen, and eventually worked its way down through the rafters of the, you know, the floors between us and, and then uh, soaked our ceiling to the point where it just collapsed. Now, at one level, you could say, well, anybody can make that mistake. Really? Anybody could make that mistake? <laughs> you know, no, it was, it was because we were dealing with radically different cultures uh, and different cultural experiences. These were people who literally came from a world in which the everyday experience was no indoor plumbing. Um, now, you know, did they want, did they enjoy a winter plumbing? Sure. But what we had was, a, you know, if we think about cultures as sort of unconscious mores, or at least this is one way to think about cultures, uncult- unconscious mores that sort of govern your life in sort of an everyday way. Well, different cultures have some very different ways of kind of going about things and doing things. 
you know, and I would be, you know, in Cambodia at, from the world that they came from at a loss, completely at a loss in terms of how to survive. They knew how to, to, to live and uh, live fruitfully in an environment like that. They came to the United States and were completely, I'm talking about these people that had been in the country less than a year, completely un, uh, sort of un, uh, unacquainted with or unacculturated into the kind of the ways of doing things that we take for granted. So to your point, Glenn, um, at a very practical level, um, it was hard for us to live with each other. <laughs> you know, when you wake up at three in the morning and your ceiling has collapsed, you're like, you know, what is going on here? I'm running, I run upstairs and pound on the door and, and uh, so finally somebody comes to the door and they open up and I, I persuade them to turn off the water in their sink. <laughs> That's literally what happened. And I could tell you story after story like that. And the multicultural gurus never deal with those sort of on the ground practical realities. How do we live together if we don't share any sort of day to day sort of wisdom in terms of how to live together in a community? Now, the, what the but the multiculturalists like to do is they like to reduce everything to sort of like window dressing. It's all about your clothes. It's all about your food. It's all about maybe the sort of the the things that uh, you know make you look colorful. But kind of the the meat and potatoes of daily life, they never want to address because you have to make judgments. If we're going to be in this world where we have indoor plumbing, there are certain things you do and certain things you don't. And that's just it. I know I've said a lot of politically incorrect things, but I'm not <laughs> going to apologize for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the weird thing is that uh, we advocate multiculturalism um, because we all like Chinese food or Thai food or whatever. That's right. That's but, right. Uh, but then you've also got cultural appropriation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. My my daughter Elizabeth, who is sitting three and a half feet from me, um, <laughs> is married to an African man. He's from Sierra Leone, and she is just waiting till someone accuses her of cultural appropriation for wearing <laughs> clothes that he gave her. <laughs> That's a beautiful thought. <laughs> well. Um, I mean, but I think I'm what you sorry have if I here, just you, 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 Elizabeth. yeah. But but I think what you have going on here is, on the one hand, you have the Enlightenment attempt to mimic a Christian view of of transcendence and unity. For example, Christianity was capable of holding to one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, of the despite all the debates on that, um, with entering into every single nation, tribe and culture. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you have is a unity and identity in Christ that transcends all of those things, yet doesn't diminish those. I mean, notice the notice, notice Pentecost, when the Spirit falls and everyone hears the same message in their own tongue, right? There is an eradication of tongue, different languages. There isn't an eradication of different cultures. There's one message that is a unifying center. So the gift of difference and the in in the in the the larger unity can be held together. The enlightenment because it it rips off Christianity but then then take it it goes its own way, it ended up sadly taking the unifying factor but making it something that almost forced everything to marginalize everything outside of it. So if it didn't fit into pure reason or pure experience, therefore it was rid. We can, we can as Christians in the West, say, oh, that was a good thing. But actually, no, because it, it threw out most of our Christianity. So the Enlightenment wasn't helpful to us as Christians on that end. It was a mimicking of Christianity, but it pushed us to the margins as well as all the other cultural differentia, if you will. May, may um, Maybe we should call it, maybe we should call it the, the great benighting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, this actually connects in with something uh, that I may do in a future episode, which is the idea of um, uh, the gospel and nationalism. Yeah. Um, okay. Because as it turns out, I think Christianity has a positive 
you know, I think scripture has a positive view of, of nationality, of, of people, groups, and things like that and their integrity. Granted, they've, they've, they're fallen and just like we are, and they need to be redeemed and depaganized um, just like we do. But I think it's got a positive view of those. So this whole thing about Christian nationalism and things like that, we have to be really careful what we're talking about there. But right. that, that any, in any event is uh, another show, perhaps. <laughs> okay, what I'd like to do now is, is, is uh, read something that I think is really uh, worth hearing. And I think this is what distinguishes uh, what he's up to, what, what Reef is up to in My Life Among the Deathworks from Charles Taylor, Secular Age, and anything else that I think uh, we could talk about. And it's this. He says, this work, meaning this book, will analyze third world works in an effort to disarm them. Think about that. He's saying that this is something he wants to neuter. Uh, he wants to destroy. Uh, he is out to kill the death works. And I think that's worth noting. And I think because of that, he's an ally. We might we might disagree with him on, on you know, some particulars, um, but at the heart of his project is something that I think any Christian should be able to affirm, that uh, the death works uh, are bad and we want to defeat them. So um, anyway, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the the it, it, what what I'm struck by is the the challenge that this raises to people who are like me, raised on and acculturated in the idea that we need to be open minded and tolerant, and we can't impose our views. Right. Somebody is going to impose their views, right. and um, it's just a question of which views get imposed uh, right. on a lot of levels, and the and. While I don't like the idea of imposition, I like the idea of persuasion. Um, you know, imposition sort of implies force. Chuck Colson used to talk about we don't impose, we propose. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of truth there. There's this sort of myth of neutrality that a lot of us are sort of brought up with. We need to have a sort of level playing field and all that. But the fact of the matter is the playing field isn't level. And it's not neutral, and that's something else it's that not neutral. Yeah, yeah. Reef talks about. Uh, let me read you another thing here that's worth considering because this is actually a, a, a matter that you addressed some time back, Tom. And I think this will get you kind of your juices flowing. <laughs> so he says here: third world denial and negation of the past is primordial, mm -hmm. kind of primordial to the third world. Yeah. Radical uh, contemporaneity will not be shut out of lives devoted to resisting it, let alone out of lives devoted to anything in particular, except entertainment and eating up life. In yeah. other words, the, the, the sort of the preference for the now over the past or even the future uh, is something that uh, we will not be able to, to shut out entirely. There's something that's going on or, around us that presses the, you know, presses the, the contemporary moment in upon us. Mm. The question raised in this book is how to read the radical, radical contemporane, uh, contemporaneity and to live with it and yet not be misdirected by it. Mm. The war, the war against the primordial present cannot be won, but it can be lost. Mm. That's an interesting thought. It can't be won, but it yeah. can be lost. The aim of this book is to support those who will learn how to read that primordial present in order to stop the losing streak of life, which is so endemic to third culture. Mm. Now, may, maybe maybe he's gone too far in sort of conceding, uh, you know, the yeah. ground to this radical contemporaneity. But yeah. uh, I think that he he's on the side of the angels here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. Saying, I'm I'm. I'm wanting to, to push against this. I, I at least don't want to lose anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Any thoughts I, on I that? I think we've, we've kind of come to a point where, I mean, I get his point, but but I think 
you know, maybe maybe it's more my my disposition, but I just think that I don't need to concede all of that. I mean, I I think that yeah. um, first of all, the contingency. I mean, this is the this is the interesting thing with all these figures. I, I noticed with with Taylor, Reef, Bart, even, um, and, and though Bart in his better moments didn't 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 succumb to this, but there's this almost this notion of fate. You know, even Bart wrote this whole book on on um you know um you know, criticizing this idea of fate as being determinative in a sense that we have to accommodate everything to it. Um, there is a logoy of the moment. I, I get that. I mean, there is a shape to this moment in time, if you will. <laughs> you know, not not to quote Pink Floyd too strongly, right? Um, but the, but there, <laughs> you know, the final cut album in case, you know, there's some mysterious people out there. Um, but, but, but there is a shape to the moment in time. Um, that shape is something we, if if Reef is correct and everyone else is correct, we can't kind of transcend that because it determines what we are all kind of indwelling. But on the other hand, it is a contingent. It, it's limited. It's dependent. It is grounded in the fact that God is continuing it in existence and and giving it the shape that it has. So because of that, it isn't final. And because of that, it isn't binding from my perspective, especially as a Christian who who indwells by the Spirit something that transcends it. So because of that, I think what we look at, at Farif may say, you know, seem determinative for us. It, it, it isn't. It's, it's much looser. Um, it, it's something into which we can actually speak something far more radical and not be intimidated by it. And I, I think that's that's really the, the the factor. I think we're very intimidated by the shape of our moment in time. And I don't think we need to be. We shouldn't. It, it's yeah. contingent, dependent, and it's something we already know that 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 in grace we're elevated above, <laughs> you know? Um and, yeah. and, and because as of that, we have like a different a, dimension we work from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, as a lot of there, our friends like to say, uh, in the end, we win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, there, there, but there, there is another side to this, and that's that you've got to start with where you are. Yeah. Right? Right. And when we look at the culture, we aren't going to be able to just sort of take the culture and take a wrench and turn, twist it into a new yeah, direction. That's, that's true. Um, so, so in a very real sense, I think – Reef speaking from his perspective as a uh, a secular Jew is looking at the world as it is and saying, "Look, there's no way we can make this thing turn on a dime." Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. I think that yeah, I'm, and, and that there's realism there. Yeah. Um, we do know that in the end we win, and we also know that we are people who should be living in light of eternity, in light of history, without becoming historicists, uh, and all of that sort of thing. I mean, you know, we should be providing a counterculture. Right, mm-hmm. right. And, and it took 300 years before Christianity became accepted within the Roman Empire. Yeah, you we know, we, we want to do it in, in uh, one election cycle. Uh, yeah, it's not going to happen. We've, we've got to be realistic about this. We have to be faithful. We've got to take a good look at, you know, anchoring ourselves in eternal truths, in in historic realities and all of those kinds of things. Yes, we've got to recognize that this isn't going to uh, immediately change the culture. It's going to be a very long-term project. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should probably wrap things up. We've gotten to that time again. Mm-hmm. You know, just one last thought on on Reef. He was married to Susan Sontag, so maybe that's why he uh, decided that. <laughs> In fact, this book, uh, My Life Among the Death Works, is dedicated to her, which is uh, something to think about. Anyway, uh, I've, I've just sent all the podcast fans uh, to Google to look up Susan Sontag. But uh, I don't want to go there. Uh, anyway, we, we do appreciate your interest in the Theology Podcast. We uh, are grateful to all the folks who give uh, on a monthly basis to uh, the work of the show. Uh, th- those gifts do matter. Uh, they do pay for the, uh, the show and, and get it uh, edited and posted every week. And, and, we're, and we want you to know that we uh, thank you for that. 
We also uh, appreciate people who give us good ratings on iTunes and other lo- other places. Uh, we don't push that as much as some shows do, but nevertheless, we do uh, appreciate when people do that for us. It does help, we're told. Um, you know, we've got a lot of folks from all over the world who listen to us, and uh, we're, we're very grateful and, and uh, very humbled by all of that. Uh, we are working right now on trying to pull some things together for our, uh, you know, Southeast U.S. tour in the fall. Uh, it's still kind of, uh, you know, in process right now, but we've kind of zeroed in on the month of October. So that's as much as I can tell you right now. <laughs> but in the days ahead, you'll, you'll hear some more. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Bye-bye. Bye now.